So, it was interesting as we began to reinvent ourselves. If you're not familiar with Ergo, we're 20 years new. But we're different in as much as we serve one hairdresser at a time. About uh, five years ago, when the economy started to go, we had bankruptcies of every one of our factories. So we didn't have anything to offer to you. You may have been disappointed by that, but we took a sabbatical of almost two years and we re-explored everything that we had learned uh, that could have been better. And it really began with the brush. Now do you remember in cosmetology school when you took brushing 101 or the history of a brush? I think there's a lot that doesn't exist, but I think there's a lot of suppositions about brushes, even something as simple as a bristle, that we don't really understand except the result. So when I met Cantrell, and uh, that was great, and Ms. Nazelli from West Valley Occupational College, we introduced, well, what is a natural bristle? Where does it come from? What does it do? Why has it been used for hundreds of years? And I think we all know, you've been taught, ladies have been taught by your mothers or grandmothers, you'd begin by brushing your hair at night, how many strokes? A hundred. Five continents, asking that question, receiving responses in different languages, it's still the same number. <laughs> it leads me to wonder if we're all related. <laughs> it's a possibility. So the reason for this was it was a grooming ritual at the end of the day because our ancestors worked outdoors. And believe it or not, a hundred years ago, air was dirtier than it was today. There was a lot of debris. Coal was being used as a primary heating agent. So it was a grooming ritual at the end of the night to brush one's hair 100 strokes to remove debris. Could have even been leaves or dirt from working in a farm or could have been bugs and your great-great-grandfather appreciated that, believe me. <laughs> so through this stroking of the hair 100 strokes, normally using horse hair, the sebum was exposed to friction. So it broke down the waxy substance, started to move it down the, oil uh, the oils down the shaft, and what was the result? Shiny hair. But if you take a look at a picture from 100 years ago, you'll see shiny crowns, and you'll see frizzy, dry, mat ends. And it started to make me think, why was that happening? And I was starting to see, and I had lunch with a friend of mine, down by the beach, he saw one of his guests, he didn't do her hair that day, we were drinking at the beach. And her hair was matte and frizzy. And he said, normally her hair looks great. Please, my, I'm so embarrassed. And we started to think maybe something was taking place with her natural bristle brush. Using technology called a scanning electron microscope, we enlarged the natural hairs. Today they're really not bore, although that term is often used. They're byproducts of the pork industry, so they remove the fibers, you know, the, uh, the hairs from the hide, and they get punched into a brush. And we began to learn that brush bristles that you see are really a bristle entering the brush and that same bristle exiting the brush. They punch it into a V. So again, we began to wonder, is it possible that the animal cuticle was responsible for creating that tension that was so necessary to change hair. And once again, the scanning electron microscope showed that the cuticle was going down, the cuticle was going up, and today we don't just stroke hair to remove leaves and bugs from it, but we're blowing it dry, using heat and tension, causing the cuticle to elevate, and it was creating an interlock-like velcro. Now, once a week, using a brush with, creates a lot of tension, might move those oils off of the scalp down the hair shaft, but on a daily basis, that interlocking created abrasion. So we began to look at the structure of a bristle. Sounds simple, but it isn't. The development of our bristles in our brushes are very, a very high density, but each one of them is a perfect cylinder. There's no outer surface to it whatsoever. And it's a heat-resistant nylon, heat-resistant to 500 degrees anyway, that's infused with this crystal. This is the basis of everything you're hearing down on the showroom floor about ion. Now, if you've ever had a guest ask you, 
can you explain what an ionic dryer does for me, or an ionic brush, or an ionic iron? In 30 seconds, here's the story. In most instances, it won't exist in tools downstairs. You could ask people, can you, well, you'll be able to ask them better questions after this. We take this crystal, it's ground into a powder, it's infused into our nylon, and as you heat this, and you're rotating your brushes through the hair, the bristle is giving off an electrical charge. The electrical charge is called a negative ion. All of the elevated portions of the cuticle, whether damaged with heat or chemicals or physically, for some reason carry a positive charge. No one's ever been able to explain why that is. But as a negative charge comes in contact with a positive charge, it causes an immediate constriction of the cuticle, makes the cuticle slam shut. For some stylists, the first time they use a brush, it's shocking because you can find the hair dries so quickly you could over dry the hair. And don't your guests often over dry their hair? They want to make sure it's really dry. So as you convey this natural negative electrical charge to the cuticle, that is a negative ion. Negative ions are created two ways. Through the presence of a crystal like this, you have to heat it for it to give off a negative charge. Or, as an example in our dryer, there's a generator that can turn negative ions on or off. Again, slamming the cuticle closed, that's the end result you always want on every finish to make it tight, shiny, humidity resistant. Definitely. Right. Lastly, you may notice, uh, well this is Big Daddy, this is a new brush. <laughs> but if you've held our brushes or visited our exhibit, you'll discover Nothing. our brushes are physically different. They have no place in the brush whatsoever to catch hair. Our last collection, though it was really kind of purpley and cute, had flaws. Frankly, there were two areas that could catch hair. We heard it. We didn't know how to fix it. They don't exist anymore. The barrel is now longer, about 20%. You could take wider sections, which would mean fewer sections, and finish faster. But Cantrell is going to share some exciting insights on how to use this. And the handle is also longer. Uh, this is not, <clears throat> pardon, the handle is composed of silicone, which is a somewhat pliable material. You can rotate this even with products on your hand, and it will not slip. We've learned, if this has happened to you, at the end of the day your hand feels numb or your fingers feel tingly, it is because ergonomists have taught us when a handle is hard or any tool is hard, we grip it subconsciously more firmly, and that is the known cause of tendonitis in this joint area. So using silicone uh, gives us a pliable, non-slip finish for the hands for the multiple thousands of rotations every day. So physically, I think you're going to find this brush feels different than your hand. One of my favorite things about this brush is when I, when I first attended the hair show and I would go around to different booths, I would pick up different brushes and I would spin them. And one of the things I noticed about the Ergo brush, and I encourage you all to do this today, is to pick up a brush and spin it. And if you hold out your arm, a lot of people, they spin it like this when they're trying or feeling it, but hold it as if you're blow drying and spin it. When I hold out the Ergo brush, I notice that it stays very balanced. And if you think about it, if a brush is staying balanced, staying positioned how you want it to work, that's less effort for you to have to keep it straight. So that's one of the cool things that I liked about it. So now, well, let's have a hand for Robert. Thank you all so much.